good day. Welcome to today's Asian Impact Webinar from the Asian Development Bank. I'm Shu Tian from the Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department. Today, we have with us a team of economists to discuss most updated economic outlook in developing Asia. This year, we experienced various headwinds worldwide. While the pandemic is still lingering and then the war in Ukraine is continuing, we see inflationary pressures, we see accelerating monetary tightening, uh, both in advanced economies and in the region. Meanwhile, um, as the largest uh, developing economy in the region, China's growth faces challenges due to measures to contain the pandemic. The ADB just released today the latest economic forecast in its flagship report, the Asian Development Outlook 2022 update. We have here today Dr. Uh, Abdul Abiyat, the Director of Macroeconomic Research Division in Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department. He will share with us the key messages in the ADO 2022 update. Without further ado, I would like to pass over to him. Abdul, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Grace, and good day, everyone. Thank you for attending our launch event today. So let me start by summarizing the key messages from our Asian Development Outlook update. Since April's ADO report, various headwinds have strengthened, and Grace has actually mentioned these already. First, Russia's continued invasion of Ukraine has raised uncertainty and unsettled commodity markets. The resulting supply disruptions and elevated food and energy prices are contributing to inflationary pressures globally. In response to higher inflation, aggressive tightening by the US Federal Reserve, the ECB, and other central banks is weakening global demand and rattling financial markets. Lockdowns in the PRC under its zero COVID policy are threatening growth and supply chains. As a result, our growth forecasts for this year are revised down from 5.2% in April and 4.6% in our July supplement to 4.3% in the current report. We've also revised our 2023 growth forecasts from 5.3% in April to 4.9% now. The regional inflation forecast has been raised from 3.7% to 4.5% for this year, and from 3.1% to 4% for 2023. The outlook is clouded by significant downside risks, including a sharp deceleration in global growth, stronger than expected monetary policy tightening, escalation of the war in Ukraine, a possible deeper than expected deceleration in the PRC, and negative pandemic developments. So let me now walk you through these points in more detail. The Omicron variant led to a surge in COVID-19 cases in developing Asia and the world in the first half of this year, but that's largely subsided, as you can see in the chart on the left. Global daily cases, which are shown in the red line, declined from a peak of 3.4 million cases a day in January to just under a million at the end of last month and currently about less than half a million now. The decline has been even more marked in developing Asia, which is shown in the black line, which saw daily cases fall by about 80% from 750,000 cases a day at its peak in March to about 155,000 cases a day at the end of August and to less than 100,000 cases a day at present. As a result of growing natural immunity and continued progress on vaccinations and boosters, COVID-19 has become a less severe disease. The right chart shows that the case fatality rate, which is the ratio of confirmed deaths to infection cases, has fallen both in develop developing Asia and globally. As a result of growing natural immunity and continued progress on vaccinations, uh, can you just keep it on the previous slide? As a result of growing natural immunity and continued progress on vaccinations and boosters, COVID-19, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, uh, we, we are on this slide. Increased immunity and Omicron's less severe health impact have allowed developing Asia's economies to reopen with BRC being the notable exception. The left chart shows Oxford University's government stringency index, which measures on a zero to 100 scale, the degree of containment and closure policies, such as restrictions on movement, and closures of schools of, and workplaces. The black line shows average stringency for developing Asia, excluding China. You can see a, a decline from mid-2021, which became more pronounced this year, with the index falling from about 55 to 30. 
This contrasts with the PRC, which is the yellow line, where in line with its zero COVID approach, restrictions remain stringent and the index remains close to 80. The easing of restrictions in the region has meant that economic activity in many economies has continued expanding in 2022. And you can see this in the table on the right. Since April, it's mostly green for India, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and other economies, indicating purchasing manager indices or PMIs above 50 or in expansionary or improving territory. The few pink or red entries in recent months indicating, indicate PMIs that are falling below 50, or which indicate deterioration in the PRC and uh, Hong Kong, China, for example, due to lockdowns, and in the Republic of Korea and Taipei, China, as external demand has weakened. Regional growth decelerated in the first half of this year, but that primarily reflects the slowdown in the PRC, where, as in Hong Kong, China, lockdowns associated with zero COVID policies led to sharp declines in consumption. In contrast, reopening and increased mobility boosted economic activity in Southeast Asia. Year-on-year -year growth, which is indicated by the orange dot, was higher in the first half of this year than in 2021, in Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, and Thailand. You can see that on the right of the slide, owing to strengthening domestic demand. And this marks an important shift from the more export-driven growth seen in earlier phases of the recovery. The Republic of Korea, Singapore, and Taipei, China were less affected by last year's Delta-driven COVID waves and thus reopened earlier. As a result, domestic demand in those economies already rebounded in 2021 and then moderated in the first half of this year. Even as growth remains resilient in most of the region, elevated food and energy prices have increased inflationary pressures globally. So you can see in the left chart in red, the price of Brent crude oil has only recently returned to pre-invasion levels on account of softening global demand. Natural gas prices, which are shown in orange and blue, soared in June and July as Russia's exports of, to Europe plunged, but these have also retreated somewhat recently. Meanwhile, as exemplified by corn, the brown line in the chart on the right, and wheat, which is the green line, food prices remain elevated, but they have fallen from their peaks earlier this year on weaker demand prospects and improved crop expectations. Rice prices, which are the blue line on the right, uh, were one factor responsible for Asia's low inflation in 2021, and they've remained broadly constant so far this year. Inflation in developing Asia, which is shown in the black line on the left chart, increased from 3% in January to 5.3% in July. While it rose above the pre-pandemic five-year average of 2.8%, which was, that was the average over 2015 to 2019, it does remain below rates experienced by advanced economies such as the US, which is the dashed line, and the euro area, which is the dotted line. There are significant differences across subregions. In the Caucasus and Central Asia, which is the orange line, inflation uh, has reached 13.5%, whereas inflation in East Asia, for example, stood at just 3%, and that's the red line. But even these subregional figures hide important differences across economies. So it, the table on the right is a bit small, but we felt it was important to show individual economies. And a lot of those differences are actually due to domestic drivers. So South uh, Central uh, Asia is on the top. You see a lot of pinks. And you see more greens in the other subregions, East Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific, with exceptions. So for example, uh, very high inflation in Sri Lanka was driven by supply disruptions and foreign currency shortages. You had fuel subsidy withdrawals in Pakistan and currency depreciation in Lao PDR. As shown in this chart, which includes economies with available monthly CPI and item weight data, food prices, which are the orange bars, and energy prices, which are the blue bars, have been the main contributors to the rise in inflation in the region this year. For developing Asia as a whole, which is the bar at the extreme left, food inflation contributed 1.4 percentage points, energy inflation 1.6 percentage points, 
while 1.1 percentage points was added by other items. For high inflation economies such as Sri Lanka, Pakistan, and Myanmar, which are at the right of the chart, food prices were the main inflation driver, but energy prices also contributed significantly to inflation. Turning to the external sector, nominal exports in the region rose by 15% in the first half of this year, although two thirds of that was due to increasing prices. In the PRC, exports bounced back in June after the lockdown in Shanghai, but they fell again in July and August, erasing all growth since the beginning of this year. There are indications that regional exports may weaken going forward. In August, manufacturing export orders declined relative to July in seven of the nine regional economies with available data. And you can see that in the chart on the right. Following five months of contraction, orders plunged in Taipei, China, that's the purple line, and further slowed in the Republic of Korea. These economies are considered bellwethers of global trade. So this may herald a wider slowdown for manufacturing across the region. Regarding tourism, the pace of recoveries really reflects the timing of, of border reopening. Panel A of the left chart shows seven economies where the rebound began last year as these economies opened earlier. This includes Armenia, Georgia, Fiji, Nepal, Maldives. And in some of these economies, tourism is actually back to normal. Panel B shows seven economies where the rebound started this year. These are all in Southeast Asia, and you can see that the absence of tourists from East Asia remains a challenge. Panel C shows eight economies where tourism has not rebounded. These include East Asian economies and most Pacific islands. The right-hand side chart shows remittances healthy in the first quarter of the year. Panel A shows remittances uh, remained robust in Bangladesh, Pakistan, and the Philippines, three of the region's largest recipients. Panel B shows that remittances were also strong in economies where remittances are largest as a share of GDP, and that includes Armenia, Georgia, Nepal, and Uzbekistan. Turning to policy, monetary policy has accelerated as central banks in the region hiked rates to curb inflation and safeguard financial stability. Following 14 rate increases in the region in Q1, there were 15 rate hikes in Q2 and another 14 in July and August. Some central banks tightened aggressively to address concerns over debt-related macroeconomic vulnerabilities, and those are the bars on the extreme left. Um, from April to August, policy rates in Sri Lanka and Pakistan rose by 800 basis points and 525 basis points, respectively. While continued price pressures, with continued price pressures, and since real interest rates remain low or negative in many economies, monetary authorities in the region may have to further tighten policy to keep inflation in check and to prevent possible capital outflows. As monetary policy tightening accelerated and the economic outlook weakened, financial conditions in developing Asia further worsened in the second quarter before partially recovering in Q3 on expectations of a possible pivot by the Federal Reserve toward less aggressive tightening. The left-hand side chart shows that most Asian equity markets closely tracked expectations of this Fed tightening path. Between April 1st and the end of August, equity markets in developing Asia posted a market value weighted loss of about 5%, mainly as a result of large losses in Q2 followed by a modest rally in July and August. Risk premiums, which you can see in the right-hand side chart, widened only marginally from 1st of April until end August by four basis points for the region as a whole. That's the black, uh, the black line, the black votes, dashed, yeah. Higher risk premiums were observed in South Asia due to debt-related vulnerabilities in some economies and in the Caucasus and Central Asia on uncertainty over the fallout from Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Although even in those two subregions, you see uh, risk premia falling in recent periods. Next slide, please. Yeah. Major Asian currencies continued to depreciate against the US dollar in Q2, and which are the orange bars in the left chart, and so far also in Q3, which are the green bars. 
This mostly reflects a strengthening US dollar on account of aggressive monetary policy tightening by the Fed. Depreciations were relatively large for economies with debt-related vulnerabilities, such as Sri Lanka, Lao PDR, and Pakistan, which are at the top of the, of the chart. Currencies in a few Caucasus and Central Asia economies appreciated due to inflows from Russia, and that includes Armenia, Georgia, and Tajikistan at the uh, bottom of the chart. Developing Asia also continued to experience outflows in the second quarter. And outflows actually, so you can see outflows accelerating in, uh, in that quarter, despite inflows from the PRC. So blue line is all of developing Asia and orange line is uh, excluding the PRC. Um, improved market sentiment has led to por uh, portfolio inflows so far in Q3. Foreign direct investment, which are the red dots uh, in this chart, have, they have, uh, has remained healthy, really reflecting the region's solid medium-term fundamentals. So softening global demand is really going to shape the region's outlook. Growth forecasts for the major advanced economies are adjusted downward in this update to 1.9% for 2022 and 1% 1 for 2023. Growth will show sharply in the US, but our baseline assumes that they will avoid another two qu consecutive quarters of negative growth. Um, so we've revised the US growth forecast down to 1.6% this year and 1% next year. Contrast uh, that to the Eurozone where we do expect uh, two consecutive quarters of uh, contraction in the latter half of this year. Um, and we forecast uh, the, our forecast for the euro is also downgraded down to 2.5%. About 2% of that is two percentage points of that is actually a carry, statistical carryover from last year. And um, in terms of our oil price forecasts, they, we expect Brent oil to average $106 this year and $95 next year. And in terms of our forecast for advanced economy inflation, We've raised that to 7.2% next year, falling this year, falling to 3% next year. So turning to the regional outlook, growth in developing Asia is expected to weaken. GDP growth forecasts for the region are revised down to 4.3% this year and 4.9% next year, as mentioned. And really downgrades to growth forecasts for the People's Republic of China are the ones that are the, are the ones that weigh the most on regional projections. Growth in developing Asia, excluding the PRC, will remain at 5.3% this year and next year. And this is actually the first time in more than three decades that the rest of developing Asia will be growing faster than the PRC. Across subregions, the biggest downward revision is in East, in East Asia due to the PRC's slower growth. So we now forecast 3.3% growth for China this year. Growth in South Asia will also weaken due to slightly, just slightly slower growth in, uh, in India and a large expected contraction in Sri Lanka. Forecasts are revised up slightly for the Caucasus and Central Asia and also for the Pacific. And South, Southeast Asia's forecasts remain largely unchanged. So developing uh, Asia's outlook does come with significant downside risks. Deceleration in global growth could severely undermine demand for developing Asia's exports. Aggressive tightening could result in sharp exchange rate depreciations, raising the cost of servicing external debt uh, and also raising financial instability. Hikes in global commodity prices could further increase inflationary pressures and lead to slower growth in the region. A deeper than expected deceleration in the PRC, either because of lockdowns or problems in the property sector, could impact the region's growth outlook, including for countries that are closely linked to it via supply chains. And lastly, there's the possibility of emergence of new COVID-19 variants, which, which does, remain a risk, does remain a risk. Other risks that require close monitoring include high public debt in some economies, food insecurity, geopolitical tensions, and climate change-related disruptions. I did have some slides on our uh, theme chapter, which is on entrepreneurship in the digital age, but given the, the time constraints, I won't discuss those now. Um, please do take a look at the, at the theme chapter, very interesting new data 
on uh, measuring the uh, digital ecosystem for entrepreneurs and ranking Asia's economies on that front. So at this stage, let me turn it back to Grace so that we can get started with the, with the panel discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Abdul, for sharing the economic outlook in the region. Uh, we now welcome the audience to raise questions uh, to Abdul and our three economists in the panel discussion today. Uh, today we have with us uh, Irfan Qureshi, an economist from the Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department, uh, Rana Hassan, a regional economic advisor from the South Asia Department, and Daisa Zara, Senior Regional Cooperation Officer from the Southeast Asia Department. Please post your questions in the Q&A box, and we will try to answer as many questions as we can during the webinar. Okay. Um, uh, today, uh, one of the, the key message uh, that Abdul highlighted in the report is uh, high, higher inflation. Inflation of, uh, pressure has become a key concern around the world. Uh, the report noted that oil prices uh, have fallen back to uh, pre eviction levels, uh, where food prices uh, remain high, although uh, there are some retreat from the peak um, because of the demand prospects weaken and crop, uh, crop expectations improve. A higher food price actually uh, not only makes uh, um, achieving inflation target more challenging and then also have substantial uh, welfare impacts, uh, particularly for the poor. Rana, uh, why food inflation is, is high in South Asia? Uh, could you share with us uh, your view on the implication of uh, India's recent tax on rice export? Thanks. Thank you, Grace. Uh, so uh, you're absolutely right. And as Abdul also uh, showed in his charts, uh, we have um, uh, essentially uh, upgraded our, um, or, or rather raised our forecast for inflation. And um, inflation in India is, of course, the big driver for South Asia, given its large weight. Um, but uh, essentially, you also see a, a good deal of variation in, in South Asia. So uh, let me just start very quickly with um, India. So here we've seen headline inflation breaching the monetary policy target uh, that the Reserve Bank of India and the central bank sets of uh, the range of 2 to 6%. Uh, and, and this has really been uh, due to uh, food price increases, but also the uh, elevated and rising global oil commodity prices that we uh, have, have seen following uh, the, 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 the global issues. Now, uh, food is, is uh, not, not just something that's driven by uh, the, the global markets. There is a large domestic component taking place. And what we've seen in India are two things. Uh, number one, uh, in, in March and April, we've seen extreme heat. So, so in March, for example, uh, we saw record-breaking heat. Uh, since records were uh, kept since 1902, we haven't seen such a hot March. And what this did is it has implications on um, uh, the wheat, uh, the wheat crop, the yield from wheat. Um, coming uh, 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 after that has been a monsoon that has delivered a total amount of rain that is actually higher than the long-term average, but it's been quite erratic. And, and what's happened essentially is that Eastern India, which is um, the, the rice uh, 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 basket, so to speak, for the monsoon months. Uh, so, so in other words, uh, Eastern India relies a lot on rains. It's not uh, as developed in terms of uh, the irrigation infrastructure. This is where you saw actually significantly lower rainfall. And, and that's where the rice uh, 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 supply shock has taken place, and, and it has led to uh, this 20% this, uh, tax on certain types of rice that you were talking about, uh, uh, Grace. Uh, but before I get back to that, let me just mention that, uh, without a doubt, the really large numbers that we see on food inflation have been coming in Sri Lanka. And Sri Lanka's case is uh, uh, more complicated. Uh, what we had was basically a fertilizer ban last year. Uh, that uh, uh, essentially led to uh, much less uh, um, uh, sowing of crops uh, than was anticipated. And then, of course, we've seen a very large uh, um, uh, depreciation. We've uh, seen a lot of macroeconomic fallout, supply uh, uh, um, uh, shortages emanating from the BOP debt crisis that we see there. Um, in other countries, too, inflation has gone up. Um, but essentially, uh, what we do expect is uh, some moderation coming in in 2023. Now, coming back to the issue of rice. So one of the things I think um, has influenced the government uh, in, in, in taking the steps that it did 
was not to go in for a ban. So if you recall, uh, you know, after in, in, in the March, April uh, uh, phase, after the extreme heat uh, was leading to reductions in, in, uh, um, in, in, in the yields uh, from the wheat crop, um, India had placed a, a, a ban on exports of wheat. And uh, many experts actually have suggested that uh, bans are not a good idea. It's better to use tariffs. So I think partly what you're seeing, Grace, is, is really a tendency. It, it, it's a positive thing in the sense of there's an attempt to control the domestic prices, come prices domestically. Uh, and you do that by increasing supply, and the increase in supply can be done in different ways. And, and the, the point a number of experts made is don't use bans, uh, use tariffs, and so we are seeing tariffs. Now, of course, in the case of rice, um, we, we have a situation where India is uh, among the largest exporters of rice, so unlike the case of wheat. Um, it really remains to be seen how things pan out just in today's uh, uh, newspapers, there's been some talk of uh, 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 you know, relaxation on the shipments, the shipments that were already ordered. So it, it, it's a fluid situation, remains to be seen how this plays out, Grace. Over. Thanks, Rana. Uh, we also uh, have uh, several uh, important food exporters and importers in Southeast Asia. Um, now I'd like to turn to uh, Doisa. What is your view on possible impacts of the uh, food inflation on food importers and exporters in the subregion? Thanks. Thank you, Grace. Okay, um, we're looking at food inflation throughout Southeast Asia. We are, we've seen that it has risen from 2% in 2021 to 5% as of end August. And um, you know, on one hand, we are seeing that the smaller import dependent countries have been uh, more affected um, from the rising prices since the start of the year. You know, um, we're looking at the 14% inflation, food inflation in Myanmar, 12% in Lao PDR around 7% in Timor and 6% in Cambodia. But the bigger economies like Indonesia and Thailand are also experiencing the same with food inflation at 6%. And then the rest of the, the Southeast Asian economies have food inflation below 5%. Now, um, accelerating food prices were driven by price increases in bread, cereals, meats, eggs, um, fats and oil for cooking, um, mainly because of the high cost of production and inputs as well, particularly wheat you know, for bread, cereals, and um, instant noodles, and uh, maize as well for animal feeds. So I said earlier that the import, the, the smaller import dependent economies have been um, hit hard simply because you know, across the region, import bills have ballooned but more so for the smaller economies, um, you know, price increases coupled with weaker local currencies. So it, it, it has inflated their um, import bills. Now, on the other hand, the export, um, export, uh, export uh, countries, exporting countries. So in the case of, let's say, uh, Thailand, um, Thailand's agricultural product and uh, Singapore's um, um, food uh, process exports are significantly benefiting from the higher prices, uh, from heightened global demand to secure food supplies. Now, for higher commodity prices, they're providing uh, windfall gains for exports of palm oil in the case of um, Indonesia and Malaysia. Now, in the case of Indonesia and Malaysia, they're using the export gains to fund subsidies for fuel and food, particularly uh, to those um, highly vulnerable groups to ensure that um, you know, prices are within reach for these vulnerable groups. I stop here, Grace. 
Uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Uh, we already see a lot of uh, questions in the Q&A box. Uh, there is a very interesting question uh, from the box uh, that I uh, I would like to read out. It is from Oliver Lee. Uh, it is also focusing on uh, Southeast Asia. Um, so the question is, uh, as an importing country, well, as Philippines, the worldwide inflation gives it a particularly negative impact compared to other ASEAN uh, countries. So uh, do you have any uh, prediction for Philippines economic outlook? Uh, yeah, um, within the uh, presidency term of the macros. So, um, uh, Doisa, uh, do, do you like to um, address this question? Thanks. Uh, okay, this is referring to the, the slowdown in the, the, the PRC, right? Philippines. Okay. Uh, only for the Philippines. Yes, okay. yes. Um, in general, the, the slowdown in PRC is likely to uh, uh, dampen growth throughout Southeast Asia. And in the case of the Philippines, also because it has, you know, it it imports in a way, it, it exports um, products to China, and then um, and but at the same time, it also imports products from China. So it depends on on how you look at it, because um, let's say importing food from China as well. So if China decides to um, beef up its domestic supply instead of exporting it to other countries then it may also affect the Philippines. But in general, the Philippines is poised to grow uh, positively this year and next year, um, mainly because of domestic demand improvement. So it's broad-based domestic demand that is fueling growth, at least in the next uh, this year and next year. Consumption has been growing strong from the reopening of the borders. And of course, mobility has improved a lot. And uh, now the economic activity has picked up. So we're seeing um, good good signs for the Philippine economy. Thank you, Grace. Yeah, thanks, Doisa. Uh, we have another question. Uh, oh, this actually links uh, closely to our current discussion on inflation. I mean, we observe that high inf uh, inflation pressures actually has uh, led to uh, regional uh, central banks also to accelerate their monetary tightening and then also um, uh, overall tighter financial conditions. So we have a question. Uh, here from uh, 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 da uh, Dennis. So the, his, uh, the question is, uh, what is the fallout of uh, tighter financial conditions driven by higher US uh, rates? And then uh, what are the uh, risks of debt crisis uh, uh, hitting the weak in, uh, weakest the countries that suffer from the, uh, the food uh, storage and uh, higher energy prices? Uh, maybe, maybe let's for, uh, focus first on the first question. Uh, Yerfan, do you um, want to share your views about uh, uh, well, how this uh, monetary uh, tightening might uh, imply, uh, what, what the uh, uh, tighter financial conditions might in, uh, imply for developing Asia, and then what is uh, uh, its implications for, for, for debt, and then also currencies. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Chris. And that's a really good question. And that's something that we've covered extensively in our report. So tighter uh, Fed policy uh, will, of course, complicate the region's uh, economic recovery. Because, uh, uh, and, and what we've seen so far is that both global and domestic financial conditions uh, have been worsening. This, the, the region has experienced uh, capital outflows, currency depreciations. And that's something that's consistent with historical experience that also suggests that periods of tightening US monetary policy are associated with capital outflows, depreciations, financial market volatility in emerging, in, 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 most, uh, in most of the region, uh, especially when tightening is uh, sharper than expected, which it, it certainly is at this point. So taken together, the fallout from the Fed's action will slow the recovery in the region. And related to debt, uh, and something that we've seen already, that a few economies in the region with, uh, with heightened macro vulnerabilities for several reasons, including a very challenging external environment and recovering from the pandemic, uh, and those with large external obligations will, be, will indeed be challenging, will, will indeed be challenged. Uh, but most uh, major, Asian economies, I do want to stress this, have strong fundamentals and are well placed to deal with these uh, negative uh, implications. Back to you, Grace. Yeah, uh, thanks, Irfan. Okay, um, let, let me check. I think uh, we, we do have other related questions. Maybe we combine two questions together. Um, so we have uh, questions from uh, Maria uh, Jaber. Oh. Yeah, wait. So, um, and then also from uh, Warren uh, Guzman. So, putting together, um, 
um, maybe I direct it to Abdul. So uh, how do you see monetary policy in Asia progressing this year? And then uh, what is your uh, view about uh, Philippine pesos performance relative to uh, other currencies? Yeah, Abdul, please. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Uh, but two separate questions, but let's let's go ahead. So on monetary policy, as you saw from the slides, there's already been uh, it's already on underway, right? The uh, tightening in the first quarter, continuing into the second and third quarters, are actually accelerating, and we expect that to continue. So one of the things we show, so uh, we you know, headline inflation has already been uh, relatively has increased, as we said, 5.3% for the region as a whole, up from 3%, mainly driven by food and energy prices. But another thing that uh, we document in our report, and I didn't get to talk about it so much, is that core inflation in several of, uh, several of our economies has also already been on the rise. So in other words, you're already seeing a broadening of price pressures. And so it is actually critical that uh, central banks stay ahead of the curve and continue tightening policy. Um, one of the lessons from what you know the what the US Fed went through is that it's pretty costly if you do fall behind the curve. Um, and so yeah, so it, you can also uh, there's another chart in our report where we basically show the change in real interest rates. You can uh, you know policy rates uh, minus expect inflation expectations, and you can see that for some countries even though they've raised policy rates, they haven't raised it by enough to keep pace with inflate with higher inflation expectations. And therefore real rates have either stayed the same or have actually declined slightly for some. Although for many others, uh, real rates have increased. So we definitely expect uh, policy rates to continue rising in inflation as, uh, you know, to, to both uh, lean against inflationary pressures to counter uh, currency depreciation and outflows and basically to just uh, safeguard financial stability. Speaking about the Philippines and the Philippine peso, uh, yes, uh, the peso is depreciated by about 13% so far. And if you look at that chart that I, I, I had in the, in the slideshow, the Philippines is not at the extreme end. It's actually very much close to the, the average for the region. So much of the depreciation in the Philippine peso reflects not so much weakness in the peso, but strength in the dollar. And so it's really, you know, again, driven by the, the Fed tightening that we, we've just talked about. And whether that continues depends a lot on what will happen in the US in terms of uh, inflation pressures continuing. So inflation, headline inflations are already declining, but core inflation in the US surprised on the upside, the, the latest August number. And so it's likely that the Fed will continue hiking by at least 75 basis points in their meeting but this week, uh, and and that will continue putting de depreciate uh, you know uh, pressure on currencies in our region to depreciate, including on the Philippine peso. Thank you, thank you, Abdul. Um, actually, just as uh, one of the audience uh, typed in the Q and A box just now, uh, we already noted that uh, some economies uh, are experiencing uh, debt vulnerabilities, and then uh, we see some economies in South Asia, in particular, uh, facing these uh, challenges. After Sri Lanka, Bangladesh has approached uh, the MF for program. Uh, Rana, you are monitoring the South Asia economies closely. Uh, could Bangladesh experience a similar BOP and that crisis, uh, how about other economies in the sub-region? Um, Grace, it's a great question. It, it comes up many times and, uh, you know, fortunately um, in, in, in economics, uh, you know, usually you, you have this on the one hand, on the other hand, but here there's a very clear answer and the answer is no. Uh, the Sri Lanka situation is just not like what we see in other parts of uh, um, uh, South Asia. Um, take the case of uh, uh, Bangladesh. You know, if we just compare these countries' external debt, uh, you know, when Sri Lanka was heading into heading into this really vulnerable zone, uh, it was having a, a public debt to GDP ratio touching 120 percent. Um, Bangladesh, uh, uh, Nepal, th these are economies that have basically been in this 35 to 40 percent zone. Um, look at external debt. External debt in Sri Lanka was about 66 percent of GDP uh, prior to you know that that the the the, the uh, crisis breaking out. And uh, we have to remember that a lot of this debt, there was a good chunk that was uh, basically uh, um, uh, 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 debt taken on from the external 
private commercial sector. Uh, if you look at Bangladesh, external uh, uh, debt to GDP ratio less than 18 uh, percent. A lot of this is is bilateral, multilaterals. In fact, uh, of the external debt, the amount that's um, you know uh, uh, taken by uh, uh, commercial borrowings is 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 it's 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 less than it's less than 15 percent. That's that's the total of external debt. Um, Nepal's case uh, uh, even similar. In fact, in, in Nepal's case. Almost 90% of the debt is to the multilateral system. So that's loans to ADB, World Bank, IMF. And as we know, uh, these loans tend to be much more long-term uh, long maturities. Uh, they're, they're linked to uh, undertaking uh, structural reforms and, and, and growth enhancing infrastructure projects. So uh, the, the situation is, is not uh, similar. It is true that Bangladesh approached the IMF, but, but it's very different. It, it's it's, it's uh, basically uh, for what's called the Resilience and Sustainability Facility of the IMF. It's a new facility, and it's there really for long-term uh, uh, um, uh, uh, supporting countries on a long-term basis as they make this transition to greener economies. Now, uh, of course, you know you could ask, well, why did Bangladesh go for it now? Uh, and, and that's really, it's, it's think of it as a precautionary motive. So uh, foreign exchange uh, reserves were coming into pressure. The current account deficit has been going up in Bangladesh. Uh, we did see uh, after fairly strong export growth in 2021, uh, we have seen uh, imports really grow much faster than, than uh, uh, exports. So uh, that was creating pressure on the current account. It was creating some pressure on the foreign exchange reserves. But again, the foreign exchange reserves are well above the, the three-month uh, uh, mark that economists uh, consider a, 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 an important benchmark. Uh, so look at it as a precautionary uh, motive, and and the discussions are still ongoing with the IMF. So, uh, uh, but but most importantly, I'll just end on this note that we have to really make a distinction between what's happening in Sri Lanka and what's happening in other countries. Yep. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks, Rana. Uh, this leads to a very uh, interesting question, and I would like to go to your fund for this. Uh, do you see uh, the, the the issues in South Asia is, is more? Uh, due to a global uh, downturn or uh, more individual structural factors like uh, for decision making. So uh, why South Asia is particularly vulnerable this time? Your fun, thanks. Thanks, thanks Grace. Um, and there are, um, that's a great question. And there are several layers to it. So let me try to answer uh, each one of them. So first of all, uh, in terms of common shocks, so the region uh, has been affected by a set of common shocks. First, the pandemic, followed by high commodity prices and rising interest rates. Uh, but there are, as, as my colleague Rana pointed out, important differences as well. So first of all, the first, first important different, different point is the differential energy point, right? So while some regional economies entered the pandemic with strong macro fundamentals, some others uh, were vulnerable. Um, so debt, for example, had been high in Sri Lanka even before the pandemic hit and lockdowns, uh, implemented as part of the COVID-19 strategy led to massive losses in tourism revenue that compounded their external vulnerabilities. And then in response to the pandemic, uh, economies had to support growth. And so given the size and scale of the damage caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, authorities had no choice but to support economic growth through accommodative macroeconomic policies. But then this led to debt and inflationary pressures in some economies. This was unwound, of course. So these policies were unwound in 2021 and 2022, such as in Pakistan, as recovery took hold and as inflation picked up. Uh, and then, as my colleague Rana also pointed out, there's, there's a lot of differences in the region. So countries that were able to control the pandemic better were also better positioned to reopen, which actually led to a recovery in consumption and investment. So Bangladesh is, is one such country which was able to capitalize on the recovery taking place in advanced economies by exporting more. Uh, I would also like to add that this is a very challenging external environment generally. So the region as a whole, not just South Asia, has been facing um, a very challenging external environment that has been triggered by Russia's invasion of Ukraine that has raised uncertainty, it has disrupted commodity markets, and regional economies have been further affected by the aggressive monetary tightening by the Fed. Uh, and that has led to currencies, as we discussed earlier, losing value, pushing a financing cost, something related to debt that came up earlier as well, but also domestic factors such as depressing investment and consumption. And these factors then weigh in on growth as well. 
back to you, Chris. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Yerfan. Uh, we, we seems to have been focusing mostly on the downside prospects. Um, maybe it's time for us to shift to, to something more positive. Um, according to Abdul, the report said the uh, export in developing Asia is, is, uh, remains healthy. Uh, we see tourism recovers uh, broadly, and then uh, there are many, I mean, more than 10 countries uh, seeing uh, uh, tourism uh, flowing in. Uh, and, Adoisa, what is the uh, prospects uh, for the recovery in uh, tourism in Southeast uh, Asia? And then uh, are there any policy prescriptions that we can extend to other economies? Thank you, Grace. Yeah, it's good to shift to something positive this time, no? Yeah, the, um, okay, in the case of Southeast Asia, the reopening of borders facilitated a quick rebound in domestic and inter-region tourism. And it increased output in travel, accommodation, and hospitality services. Now, looking at international tourist arrivals, um, there has been an improvement. But you know, comparing it with other regions like South Asia, if we compare it with the, the pre-COVID uh, level, it's still below the the um, the uh, below 2019 level. But there is an improvement. So from let's say 96.5 below COVID-19 in January, it has gone down to 85% in May. And then um, most of uh, you know, the improvement came from the, as I said, what I've said, reopening of the borders, as well as removing the travel restrictions. So let's say in Thailand, there were around 2 million tourist arrivals in uh, the first half of 2022, compared to 40,000 in 2021. In uh, Malaysia, they hit um, half their target for the year at 1 million in the first half of 2022. And then uh, for Cambodia, it has increased significantly from 100,000 in 2021 to 500,000 this year. The same is in the case of uh, the Philippines. So in the first eight months, we saw around 1.4 million and then Vietnam as well. So uh, this is the good news. Now, on top of that, domestic tourism was also upbeat. You now, since um, the more mobility now, um, uh, or less restrictions on mobility now, are, 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 we're seeing that around uh, throughout Southeast Asia. We can see that in Thailand, um, domestic tourists uh, totaled around 94 million by June, compared to around 36 million last year. But in Vietnam, there were around 61 million local tourists. And this was 1.3 times the number um, before COVID. So it, it was a big boost uh, for the economy. And at the same time for the Philippines as well. Um, we don't have the latest figures yet, but domestic tourism is also on the rise in the Philippines. So it's important to revitalize this uh, industry because pre-pandemic tourism and travel accounted for about 5 to 26% of GDP uh, across Southeast Asian economies, and as well as 7 to 24% of employment. So it is really an important, important um, uh, sector. And, and it's good that you know, with the high vaccination rates, um, open borders, uh, less or almost no, no travel restrictions, Hopefully, you know, we can see more international tourists because for now we're just seeing inter-region, so mostly from Southeast Asia and India coming to the region. But since it's a favorite destination also among um, Western uh, uh, people from Europe, then hopefully as, you know, as the uh, economy improves, then we can also see next year and 2024 more international tourists arriving. Thank you, Grace. Uh, thank you, Dasa. Uh, we, we also have uh, some, some trade-related questions from the floor. Um, uh, next question is about South Asia. Um, a, couple, a question from a couple uh, got time. Uh, the question is, uh, how do you see Nepal's economy? Um, how Nepal's economy will be affected since Nepal has been much more uh, trade dependent than to India? Rana, uh, would you like to address uh, this question? Thanks. Uh, sure, Grace. So, uh, in, the, in the case of uh, Nepal, uh, you know, we do expect that in uh, 2023, the uh, economy will grow by uh, around 4.7%. So it's marginally lower than what we were expecting uh, in, in April. Uh, that was at uh, 5%. Uh, 
uh, inflation is an issue, uh, but uh, it's it's not uh, uh, very highly elevated like you see in some other parts of uh, Asia. It's about 6.1% that we're uh, expecting. Um, the, the one thing that we do expect is the current account deficit to uh, remain uh, a little elevated. Now, we do think that uh, uh, th there's going to be an improvement. So if we look at, uh, you know, the, the 2022 fiscal year, which just ended a few months back, uh, the the, the, the current account deficit was quite high, um, hitting about 12.9% of GDP. Uh, we do expect it to come down. So we, we are seeing a recovery now. Uh, uh, some months ago, you know, there were uh, uh, so some concerns about uh, depleting foreign exchanges, et cetera, but the government took uh, some, some strong steps to control imports. Um, and uh, what we do see is that these have had some effect. Uh, and we are seeing actually that uh, foreign exchange reserves in terms of uh, uh, just the, the, the months, uh, the, the months of coverage has, has gone up. Uh, it, it's, it's at a, a safe level. And uh, remittance is quite an important uh, um, uh, for the Nepal economy. And what we've been seeing in some of the numbers is that there's a, a, a large number of um, uh, uh, workers who will be uh, going out. Um, and, and so that's always a, a positive. Uh, in, in other words, we can expect remittances to, to once again play that important role that it does for the economy. Uh, you know, regarding the linkage with India, we have to remember that uh, in India, uh, despite the lowering of our uh, uh, growth forecasts uh, by a little bit, it's still at, at 7%. So this is an economy in India which is growing at 7%, which actually helps uh, uh, the neighboring economies which trade a lot. So overall, I, I think, uh, yes, uh, we do have uh, to just wait and watch, uh, but, but uh, um, I, I think things are under control there. Over. Uh, thanks, Rana. Um, another, oh, we, we have another very interesting question from the floor. It's from Oliver Lee. It's about PRC. So as the presenter said, it's the first time in the past three decades that the rest of Asia grows faster than the PRC. Does it mean that uh, the long-term China uh, economic miracle story has ended or is it just a short-term uh, fluctuation? Uh, maybe Abdul, do you want to uh, answer this question? Sure, and let me keep it short. I mean, basically it's a component of their, their both short-term and long-term components. Let me talk about the short-term real quick. A big part of the downward revision this year does reflect short-term factors, as specifically the recurrent lockdowns that they've had to do under the zero COVID policy. So that's the main cause for the downgrade this year. Another short to medium term factor is vulnerabilities in the property market that is affecting investment and consumption given the size of uh, household wealth held in uh, the property sector. Um, and it'll take, it, it also that has bearing for the medium term because it'll take several years to resolve that. But there are these long-term structural factors that are really slowing, that have been slowing China's gr growth over, over several years already, and that will continue. One is the aging of China's population. And the second is the fact that the old growth model, which was based on uh, you know, low cost assembly, no longer works for China because they're now upper middle income. And so China really has to uh, look to you know, doing more innovation and climbing up the value ladder to, to boost growth. But so there, there is a substantial portion of the slowdown we've seen in China that is long-term and structural. Back to you, Grace. Uh, thanks, Abdul. Um... Uh, the, the report actually uh, mentioned uh, climate change as a midterm uh, risk. And then we do have uh, uh, Adina from the floor asking a question uh, about uh, with a greater uh, pressure on public budget in developing Asia. Um, uh, what do you think with, uh, will happen with government's policy commitment on uh, climate change mitigation, especially on renewable energy and plans to, to remove fossil fuel subsidies? Um, maybe, uh, Doisa, uh, can you share, share, share some of your views, uh, particularly focusing on Southeast Asia? Thanks. Hi, Grace. Um, okay, I'm, I'm not sure if this is uh, referring to agriculture, to food inflation. Uh, the uh, impact this is more climate, climate change, so, so climate change. In general, and, on the yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. weather, yeah. All right. Um, in general, you know, Southeast Asia is um, vulnerable to climate change impacts. And, uh, you know, like, for example, the, the a 1% increase in temperature can increase food inflation by 0.5 to 0.8 percentage points 
in countries like Indonesia, Thailand, and um, Myanmar. So, um, and then uh, other uh, uh, disasters can also affect uh, production. And uh, you know, three of the countries, Indonesia, Philippines, and Myanmar are the highly, the most vulnerable countries in the region. Now, talking about um, addressing climate change, you know, uh, the, um, the countries are committing them to uh, the COP26, you know, uh, to a carbon, uh, low carbon economy. And uh, I think what we, are, we have learned from the pandemic, from the shocks uh, recently from the Russian invasion of Ukraine is that governments need to act fast. They need to increase spending you know, for, to help the economy to have or towards a green recovery. Because by only doing so that we can ensure you know, a sustainable environment, sustainable economy. Now, the problem is the, the funding for that. And uh, many of the, you know, um, I think right now they are, they are in talks, let's say with the MDBs like ADB, asking for assistance on how to um, come up with a roadmap, you know, to, to have a framework on funding of uh, what are the sectors to be prioritized, what are the projects to be prioritized so that they can reach their targets. And uh, I think at this point, um, some of them, some of the countries are well in advance, but some of them are already uh, issuing green bonds like Thailand, and the others are planning to do so. So it's an interesting stage at this point because um, each one is learning from the other. You know, like electric vehicles is very much popular nowadays, but then it may not be the case for Southeast Asia. But then, you know, we, we may end up seeing e-ferries like you know, in Thailand, that is the plan. So we are uh, going towards that um, route. You know, um, doing uh, doing green technology, um, green projects, so that we can hire or generate more jobs, and um, at the same time protect the environment. I stop here. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Dosa. Um... Well, uh, thanks to our panelists, we only have two minutes left. Uh, thanks everyone for a very comprehensive and insightful discussion. Uh, we, we now run for almost one hour, so we still have a lot of questions answered, but we have to leave them there today. Uh, for your information, uh, both the full ADO update report and then the webinar recording are available on ADB website, www.adb.org. Uh, before we conclude, I would like to let you know that our next Asian Impact webinar will be held on 7th October. The topic is uh, leveraging social media to discern the public voice for development. We will have one speaker and then four panelists to show um, how different stakeholders can harness uh, social media data uh, to inform um, policy debates and uh, facility development. Uh, please go to ADB website to register for it. And then we look forward to seeing you again soon. With this, uh, let me thank everybody for joining us today. And then also uh, thanks to our panelists and Abdul uh, for sharing the knowledge. See you next time and stay safe.